thank you for that kind introduction and good afternoon. I was so impressed to see everybody was here on time, very punctly. That's excellent. Uh, usually you say come back at two, people show up around three o'clock. Uh, so it's great to see such a great turnout uh, on a snowy uh, afternoon, uh, particularly on a Friday before a, a holiday weekend and on Valentine's Day, no less. Um, Thanks to all the organizers, thanks to so many dear friends, folks that I know, and many new faces uh, for the invitation to come up here and get out of DC. Always a real pleasure to escape DC madness uh, and talk with uh, others outside the Beltway. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A and having some back and forth uh, and hearing what's on your mind. Um, I had to giggle a little bit at the title of this panel. Um, we talked about it, it sounded good at the time, but now I'm thinking designing national security policies at the highest level. Um, well, you know, when you're, when you're in government, you, there's, not, there's not much time to design anything. It's uh, very much triage and reacting to uh, the issue of the day. Uh, and so I'm more than happy to answer questions or engage in a discussion about uh, my time in government, both at the Pentagon uh, and the White House uh, with the Obama administration over the last five years or so. Uh, but really what I wanted to talk about today, given the, what we're here to talk about, is kind of some of my observations about the transatlantic relationship over the last couple of years, and particularly uh, the U.S.-German relationship while I served uh, in government, because uh, it was a real learning experience, and I'd like to share some of the lessons that I drew from, from that uh, experience. So first, you know, I've been, I've, I haven't been around and working transatlantic issues uh, for 50 years. I have worked transatlantic issues and on the U.S.-German relationship in particular for a good 20 years. And as we all know, the U.S.-German relationship has really evolved over those last two decades in many, many different ways. And the transatlantic relationship itself, I mean, it used to be decades ago that we spent an enormous amount of time talking about each other and talking about how we dealt with each other and issues we might have with each other's policies and focusing very much inward on our relationship. And of course, what's transpired over the last two decades is we spend less and less time talking about us and we t spend a great deal more time talking about how we can work together to deal with the rest of the world and global challenges. And some people find this really disheartening. Some people say, oh, I yearn for the good old days when the transatlantic relationship was kind of the beating heart of US foreign policy and really drove a lot of the dialogue and discussion that we had. I, I have never been that disheartened by that change um, as I've watched it unfold over recent years, in part because particularly when I was in government, I could see how much this relationship was a core part of everything we did at the White House and the Pentagon. So in other words, I was never asked to go down to the Situation Room for an urgent crisis meeting on our relationship with Germany. I was, several times a day, asked to go down to the Situation Room to deal with Yemen or Iraq or Egypt or Syria or North Korea. And just about without fail, in every single one of those engagements, a hand would go up about 10 minutes into the meeting and the question would be asked, who's called London, who's called Paris, who's called Berlin? What are they doing? What's their response? How are they reading this? What type of intelligence do they have? Do they have people on the ground? How are we gonna work together? Do they have policy proposals? And immediately it became somewhat of a transatlantic discussion. And so I never had this gloomy sense that the wonderful glory days of the transatlantic relationship was somehow in dissent, but in fact it had changed. And that was all right because so much of what we have to do together is about working together. Of course there are areas where we don't work together and North Korea would be one example where there's not as much obviously cooperation in that sphere given where Europe sits and its own security interests and its priorities. But other than that, I would say particularly in the Middle East and Africa dealing with former Soviet states, and the list goes on and on, almost everything that happened in the Situation Room had a European piece to it. And I found that very reassuring. Um, and even as the United States has worked on the ever famous pivot to Asia or rebalancing, as I've been instructed to call it on many occasions, although the President has also used pivots, all very confusing, 
But even as the administration has pursued that policy, we've found instances where we have been able to work with the Europeans on an Asia agenda. We've had some very fruitful discussions, particularly with the EU, on both of our relationships with ASEAN, the ASEAN Regional Forum. We've talked about work that we can do together in places like Burma. We've talked about our very separate and unique relationships with China. And while we may not share a military or defense agenda in Asia, for all the obvious reasons, I think we do share, in many ways, a diplomatic and a development assistance agenda in that region and will continue to do so. And so I'm not, again, I haven't felt particularly gloomy uh, on that front as we've watched the, the relationship evolve and change. Now, does that mean that we always get along? Absolutely not. We don't always get along. We've had many, many policy differences over the years, over many decades, even in the, quote, glory days from long ago during the Cold War. And some of the most obvious, harshest ones obviously occurred shortly after 9-11, when we had very different views on how to address the threat of terrorism, Europeans in many ways looking at it more as a law enforcement challenge, using those types of instruments and tools, Americans obviously turning quite rapidly to the military instrument, and then deep, deep disagreements about the war in Iraq, uh, Guantanamo, the use of torture, extraordinary rendition, the list went on and on. And so it's, it's quite clear that even though Europeans and Americans are definitely working together to tackle a variety of challenges around the world, we are not short on our differences, policy differences specifically. Now, when Obama came into office, I know there was a great deal of optimism and hope. Um, he had very high approval ratings in Europe uh, among the publics uh, on, the, on the other side of the Atlantic. And I think there were very high expectations about what this administration would be, bring to the transatlantic relationship. And for a while, I think the mood music and the atmospherics did change, did change for the better. And we saw some changes that Europeans had been asking for for quite some time in shifts and changes to US policy. But as we soon found out, as I soon found out, sitting in the Europe office, in the office of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon, uh, we had a number of differences uh, as well. Even on what seemed like obvious common areas of cooperation, uh, for example, in the NATO sphere, we had uh, some pretty feisty debates over NATO's strategic concept that we set out to draft together. We had uh, a number of disagreements over NATO nuclear policy. We had uh, some bumps in the road on pursuing missile defense, how that would be structured and implemented. Uh, NATO reform ended up being quite a challenge for us. So even in this very obvious space, this traditional area of NATO issues and the NATO relationship, we found that immediately and quite early on in the administration, there were moments where we found ourselves at odds. Then there were a whole host of other issues that transpired over the course of my time in government. Um, one of the probably best known disagreements uh, was tied to the intervention in Libya, where as we will all remember, Germany decided not to participate that created some tension uh, in the relationship, um, not to the extent where we were, you know, suddenly bringing up each other and uh, there was a lot of yelling or, or frustration, just um, a, a number of open-ended questions about where German leadership was headed at that time and what Germany's vision for German foreign policy should look like and where Germany wanted to take its security policy to deal with 21st challenges. So a lot of open-ended questions around that. And then obviously on the financial crisis, Obama and Merkel got into this very common routine uh, where they would ring each other up and have a, a very familiar conversation about the merits of austerity versus growth, and we'd go round and round on that merry-go-round uh, many times a year. And so it doesn't mean that the relationship uh, was sour in those early years of the administration. Uh, I'm just stating that despite the fact that we had uh, a number of issues where we were able to work very, very productively and effectively together, we were definitely uh, not without our moments of disagreement in the policy sphere. Now, most recently, uh, we've had more of an existential crisis in the bilateral relationship. 
And we've had a lot of open-ended questions, particularly between Germany and the United States, on two fronts, really on, on the question of trust and on the question of leadership. And here, obviously, we all are familiar, and I know the last panel uh, got to the heart of some of these disagreements um, due to the, the NSA revelations and uh, also the Snowden affair and all the rest. Uh, deep, deep frustration in Europe and outrage in many cases about the way in which the U.S. has gone about collecting intelligence and treating its allies and partners. And now uh, there are a number of questions about the roots of this relationship. What are the expectations for each side as they work together? How much should they trust each other? Were we taking each other for granted? These are deeper questions than just sheer policy disagreements about who's going to Libya and who's not going to Libya. This really gets at the core of who we are as partners and what we see as a vision for us working together in the future. I would pair that trust debate with another debate uh, about leadership. And here I see finger pointing on both sides of the Atlantic. I see finger pointing from our European friends, pointing back to Washington, asking broad questions about whether or not the US is prepared to lead in ways that it once did. Uh, after deep complaints and a long list of complaints about the way in which the Bush administration was choosing to lead uh, during its term, now there are open-ended questions about whether or not the Obama administration is not leading enough. Uh, and so you can find different colors and flavors of this debate as you travel from capital to capital. And the debate certainly changes as you travel through the Middle East and Asia. You hear other questions about American leadership and what it means in this day and age for the United States to assume a leadership role. And that's paired with some open-ended questions that Americans have, particularly for Berlin, about German leadership. And again, not just tied to Libya, but in other cases where we've seen some hesitation for Berlin to lean into a crisis, particularly outside of the economic sphere, questions about whether or not uh, Berlin was or had an actual clear vision on what it wanted to achieve with its foreign and security policy. And so we have a case where both sides are asking some interesting questions about the, the whole concept of leadership uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Now I find this, these types of debates troubling, these kind of existential crises uh, troubling, and not just because or for what it says about us as partners, but why, the reason I find it so troubling is really for what it says for our ability to cope as partners with a very transformative landscape right now in the world. So just to describe what's happening for a minute, um, having been at the White House in particular and having been tasked with having to manage the full foreign policy agenda across every region of the world, I can assure you, and I think no one here would disagree, that the world is essentially on fire. Obama's old campaign line of the urgency of now is really relevant uh, for what we're facing as a country and as partners. Everywhere you look, in essence, whether it's in Africa or the Middle East or the South China Sea or North Korea or developments in Ukraine, there's cause for concern. And it feels many ways when you're sitting at the White House that you just, you, you can't keep up. You're literally swinging every 30 minutes from one crisis to the next. And it's hard to wrap your head around the number of foreign policy challenges that hit you by the hour. Now you take that reality and you pair it with a number of other realities that we in the West are facing jointly, and you come up with a pretty grim picture. And what do I mean by that? Well, both the United States and Europe are facing severe resource constraints in their ability to fund and support new tools in the foreign policy toolbox and support policies to deal with all of these challenges that I just mentioned. Two, on top of it, it seems that we both are suffering from war-weary publics, coming off 10 years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere in the world. We're still in the Balkans. Many of us are engaged in various conflicts in Africa that we're finding that our publics, through polling data, 
are just utterly exhausted. We've seen some polling data in the last couple of months in the United States that indicates for the first time in 40 years the, the most negative perceptions about whether and how the U.S. should lead in the world. Deep skepticism about the utility of things like development assistance, the promotion of democracy and human rights. And this is reflected in our president right now who's trying to be responsive in part to a public that is exhausted and war weary and has open-ended questions coming off these missions in the Middle East and South Asia and at the same time trying to come up with new innovative policies moving forward. We also have uh, a situation where our militaries are exhausted. They've been on multiple deployments. They too, not just the public, are pretty exhausted. And we're facing a period in our history where the militaries now appear that many of them will have the freedom to come home and recover from this long period, in essence, two decades of war and deployments around the world. And so questions about how we want to use military, our militaries in the future, are very prevalent in the national security debates on both sides uh, of, the, of the Atlantic. On top of it, as we have all of these foreign policy challenges brewing, we found that despite our best efforts since the fall of the Berlin Wall, we have been unable to develop the civilian tools that, that we wanted to have in our toolbox post the Balkans. We have been talking for almost 20 years about the need to invest in non-military tools for our collective toolbox with very limited success. In some ways, Europeans have done better than the United States in this regard. You'll remember that the United States, just in the first term of the Obama administration, put out the QDDR, uh, with the hope of focusing our strategy and our resources on non-military instruments of national security, but that QDDR document did very little to change the debate in Washington, and it certainly didn't move the resources in any real uh, substantive way. Just adding a little gloom to the situation, we also have an alphabet soup of institutions that we worked very hard over the last 70 years to create. The UN, the OSCE, the EU-US relationship, NATO, the list goes on and on. We have these wonderful multilateral institutions, but the reality is that after several decades of use, many of them are finding that they're a little rusty, a little creaky, and not necessarily equipped to deal with 21st century challenges. You take something like cyber, and it's very hard to find a home for transatlantic debate, let alone global debate, on the issue of cyber. We're frantically trying to change that and develop new forums and cram cyber into the EU-US relationship, see if there's a piece that the UN might take on, see if NATO might take a piece of it. But many of these global commons challenges, maritime security, space, and cyber, don't naturally fit into the institutions that we've worked so hard uh, to create. And then the last thing I wanted to mention are the shifting centers of power in the world, the rise of emerging powers around the world that are questioning the value of liberal democracies and also aren't necessarily drawn to the West in ways that we had hoped or the institutions that we spent so long building. Many of them say, look, we weren't present at the creation. Why should we then bow down to these various international institutions? We'd like to talk about a new set of rules of the road and new ways we can work together. And so when you pair this list of this evolving, kind of this description of this evolving landscape in the area of foreign policy and national security, with the challenges we face at home, many of us have long lists of domestic challenges that we'd prefer to address and our publics want us to address. And yet you also acknowledge the fact that the world is essentially on fire and we've got an, a never ending list of foreign policy challenges. You see exactly how challenging this is. And for me, what it says is, while we have to focus on the core of the U.S.-German relationship and rebuild the trust and address the questions that Germans have about surveillance and get to the question of leadership and rework this relationship, bring in the next generation, at the same time we have to widen the aperture a little bit and get beyond the navel gazing and focusing on just us to deal with this evolving landscape. And that's obviously a very tall order. But in short, I think what we have to do is 
ensure that we work on not only just our bilateral relationship, but see what we can do to bring new victories and achievements to the transatlantic relationship and the bilateral relationship. And there, I'm really hoping that we can deliver on TTIP, the, the trade agreement, so that we could have kind of a new way to describe this relationship and let it be kind of a way to restart our engines. It would bring a new narrative to this relationship, and it would also have a global impact by setting global standards. And I, I'm, I'm, I recognize and I'm clear-eyed about the challenges that we both face on both sides of the Atlantic for making that happen, but I'm really hoping that that would be one major achievement for us within the next year to two to two years. I also think we really have to see what we can do to fight the instinct at home towards retrenchment. Again, we have a number of folks on the left and the right in the United States that are arguing for some sort of retreat from the world. And I think to the extent that we find those trends and those instincts on either side of the Atlantic, we have to continue to keep messaging and persuade people that that's not in our collective best interest. And we've got too much work to do to fall prey to that. Finally, I'd say we've got to really work to widen our dialogue um, with various other corners of the world. That includes Asia, not just the immediate periphery, not just the Euro-Atlantic area, but we have a lot of work to do to expand our cooperation in places that stretch beyond kind of our traditional AOR. Now, I know all of this sounds very ambitious, and uh, I, I don't want to just present you with a, a laundry list of things that we have to do but may never accomplish because of so many challenges that we face. But I, th I think really there's no alternative. I mean, in some ways we, we have to be ambitious. We can't afford to navel gaze. We can't afford to muddle through. I was very encouraged by the speeches that we saw at the Munich Security Conference coming from the German side. That was ambition. I saw ambition there. I heard ambition. I want to see more of it on my side of the Atlantic as well. And I'm hoping through the various presidential engagements in Europe that we'll see in the coming weeks uh, that we'll see glimmers of that ambition on both sides of the Atlantic. So I, I want to be optimistic. I want to leave you not with a gloomy scenario, but I will warn you that if we don't get through this challenge that we have bilaterally right now, this, these tensions in our relationship, I think it will hurt our ability collectively to deal with a world that is truly in the middle of one of the most transformative periods of its history. Thank you very much. minutes for questions. <clears throat> I like to ask the difficult questions. So it seems to me the problem that's lurking behind your concern is th the idea that you seem to buy into that the United States should be able to control uh, and dominate the outcome of many of these events. And I think part of the, the left's view, which I represent, is that uh, the United States has tried to control many too many events and governments and economies for far too long. And so the, I think there's a fundamental issue you're missing, which is that even within the US and certainly uh, on the left, there's uh, major ethical and moral reasons for why the United States should retrench because it's done a lot of evil around the world and you're not uh, acknowledging the evil. You know, we've overthrown dozens of governments around the world over the last hundred years? Well, I guess it's, uh, well, first of all, I think you got the wrong impression, uh, and I'll try to counter that. Um, but I think it really depends on what you're talking about in terms of retrenchment. I mean, if you're talking about uh, not unilaterally invading other countries, um, if you're talking about use of force issues, if you're talking about closing Guantanamo. I mean, I, I think this administration in particular has worked very hard not to follow in the footsteps of the Bush administration in many ways. But I think there is a risk of overlearning some of the lessons of the last administration if, in fact, you're suggesting that the U.S. should not assume a leadership role in shaping the national security landscape and trying to persuade countries to take a certain course of action or push countries towards negotiation 
or promote democracy and human rights? I would say absolutely not. So I guess what we have to do is we have to have a debate about what US internationalism or collective transatlantic internationalism, how do you want to define that? And I'm certainly not one that's going to advocate that we go around bossing other countries and telling them what to do. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that the US should control all outcomes, that we should control the internet, that we should control all trade in the world. But I think there is a special role for US and Western leadership in certain corners of the world. I think the US, it has failed, but the US working with its European allies has worked very hard, for example, in recent weeks to broker some sort of political solution in Syria. I supported that course over military intervention. So again, we're, I, th I, I think you'd be surprised if we sat in a coffee shop for a few hours how much we'd actually agree on that. It's just, it's how far do you swing in the other direction, I guess, is my question. Hi, um, Ms. Smith, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Josh Stan, I'm with the Bertelsmann Foundation. Um, I wanted to see if you could comment a little bit on one of those parts of the world that you say were on fire, namely Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, so you've had Assistant Secretary Newland's leaked comments last week, which I don't want to focus so much on the substance as much as the message that was taken away from it, that the US and EU are on very different planes as far as how to approach that issue. And there seems to be differences both on the views of what carrots and sticks are available to address the issue, and as far as fundamental differences and how you use them. Um, how do the US and EU in that situation sort of circle the square in terms of finding common ground on how this issue needs to be addressed? What do we do to entice a regime like the Yanukovych regime to you know, take steps towards improving democracy, and also coming together on what sort of you know, sticks do we have, or whether it's sanctions or anything else, and deciding on those kind of issues in terms of addressing that situation. Thank you. Um, so the US-EU uh, relationship, actually, talk about an evolution, has come so far, really, since the back end of the Clinton administration. You know, you'll remember uh, Secretary Albright and President Clinton had the ever-famous three Ds when they referred to um, EU efforts to develop ESDP and move into a greater role in the sphere of foreign policy. And so Washington was very nervous during that period in time uh, and questioned deeply the value of having the EU operate in that space. The Bush administration came in and took the same position, very anxious, worried about the impact on NATO, curious about kind of how this would impact the broader uh, US-European relationship more broadly. There were two concerns, kind of one, ultimately these efforts inside the EU would make the EU weaker uh, because it would be unable to take a decision or some worried on the opposite side of things that it would actually make the EU stronger and would serve as heaven forbid a counterbalance to US interests and so we went through the first term of the Bush administration um, and we saw many uh, characteristics of those fears on both sides play out policy wise uh, and then finally in 2005, I remember Bush decided to actually, he was the first U.S. president to visit the EU, uh, the commission and the council. I had a lengthy visit. It was largely symbolic, not much came out of it. But I think that was the beginning of a little bit of a, of a shift um, in the perspective of the United States where we started to shed some of the deep reservations we had. And then as we moved into the Obama administration, there were a number of us at that point saying, look, let's get over it. Um, the reality is the world's on fire, we need partners, particularly if folks feel like it's easier for them to put an EU patch on a military commander versus a NATO patch, knock yourself out. At that point, we really wanted to see the EU build capacity. Now, you can argue that uh, the EU has not built real capacity, or to the extent that it has, it hasn't been able to put it to use. Uh, and we could have a whole separate conference just on that issue alone. But my point is that for Washington, I think while we still prefer NATO for all the obvious reasons, we're a member of the alliance, we lead this alliance, we help build it, we're not a member of the EU, um, we still prefer that channel, but I think you can walk the halls of the Pentagon and find guys in uniform who say very not complimentary things about the EU. Uh, the world has changed, and so my bottom line on that front is that we've gone through an interesting kind of three administration uh, policy uh, on the EU proper in this sphere. Now, 
All that said, we continue to have moments where we roll our eyes at each other and we get frustrated on the US side because we still feel like the EU is too slow to act uh, in this sphere. We get frustrated uh, because we don't see kind of the the cadre of leadership or leaders that we'd like to see. Lady Ashton, in many ways, chose to focus very much internally on the mechanics of building her team and the external action service for all the understandable reasons. Uh, but I think there's been kind of a gnawing friction in this relationship, well, in part because also Europe had to deal with the financial crisis and all the rest. And so kind of the age-old debate about you know, the EU and the US poking each other, you know, the EU has things that, you know, America drives them crazy. I mean, it just goes on and on. And you could see in Toria's comment, it's the same old, you know, an American rolling the eyes, the EU's not acting fast enough. And why is that so? And why can't we have a faster action in this regard? But at the end of the day, I mean, Toria is one of the biggest uh, supporters in general of the transatlantic relationship. I mean, she's clearly frustrated with Ukraine. Frankly, I think she's frustrated with US policy in Ukraine, if I can be totally honest about it. So I don't want to stand up here and tell you that America has all the answers. This was not our project, and in many ways, we stood down and chose not to get that engaged initially. Now we're more engaged. We're trying to see what combination, mostly of carrots, not sticks, we can bring to this. The reality is that Yanukovych had, despite how much we dislike it, had every right to take this decision, right? And there's only so much we can do to compete with the cash cow that he got uh, from the Russia side. Um, and so how does the EU and the US play in this space? Well, we're not gonna be writing a check like that, right? We can make our case and argue until we're blue in the face about this, about why we think they made the wrong decision. And we can offer support to the opposition and all the rest, but there's a limited amount of, 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 of tools that we can throw at this problem. So I think what you saw in a heated moment is deep frustration. I'm sure you could you know, hear similar conversations on the other side, throwing their hands up, what's the US doing? Why are they in our business? This was an EU agreement after all. So we get frustrated with each other. Uh, it's not breaking news. Uh, I know she regrets <laughs> actually using the term. Um, but in any case, I think it represents our shared frustration with the nature of the problem. From German Weekly Decide. Thank you, Julie, for your fabulous remarks. That was really political insight at its best. I have a um, question, you know, concerning your remarks um, related to uh, the, uh, the German new policy, uh, you know, that you listened to in Munich. And uh, to me, it seems like a contradictory or anti cyclical movement or development, you know. It, when you look at the past and some of the frustration that is felt now is the consequence of you know, a lot of frustration that was experienced in, in, in the last military engagements from Afghanistan over Iraq to Libya. So now you know, people talk of the right to protect or the responsibility to protect and, uh, and, and Germany said, okay, we, we, we should also play a more you know, responsible role, but at the same time, military involvement becomes less and less probable. You probably will never see for uh, the foreseeable future another United Nations security resolution you know, like it happened in Libya. Uh, when you look at Syria, uh, there is actually no way forward. So I would like to know from you what could be done and what the transatlantic relation could contribute to a path forward when you see at the same time that probably milita military engagement will be less and less probable, even though more countries might promise it, but it's less probable that it will take place. Yeah, I mean, I, so just to back up, I mean, I, while I applauded um, the tone and the, the speeches in Munich by a lot of the senior German officials, I mean, I, 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 I applaud efforts to have Germany kind of have its Sheryl Sandberg lean in moment um, and, and, and push towards, you know, a more assertive foreign policy. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to give anybody the impression that um, I necessarily, equal, that, that in that mind, in my mind, that equals military intervention. I mean, I, I'm certainly not going to tell 
a any country that they've got to be more active militarily. I mean, that, that's, first of all, not the role of the United States. And I, I, I don't think that necessarily means having a more assertive foreign policy. I think on the German leadership question, I mean, we, we were, you know, the administration was just looking um, for instances where Germany wanted to take a leadership role in certain foreign policy challenges. And so it could be in the Balkans. You know, we, we saw tremendous EU leadership most recently in brokering another round of, of negotiations there. Uh, maybe it's in Germany's particular Russian uh, unique bilateral relationship with the Russians. Maybe it's dealing with Arctic challenges. Maybe it's, uh, you know, democracy promotion, whatever it is. I just think part of the issue on the American side is that we were having a hard time figuring out where Germany wanted to take that leadership role, even if it's in the area of development assistance or diplomacy, and you take the, the military piece uh, off the table. And so in that case, I mean, we'll have to see what materializes in this case and wh what the vision actually translates into in terms of actual policies. Now on Syria, I mean, that that's, I mean, I, I, I don't even know where to begin on Syria. Um, it's, I mean, it's intractable, and um, we've now put almost all of our eggs in Geneva II, uh, uh, which I supported when I was in the administration and uh, thought was one of the better courses of actions that we had available. I mean, military intervention at this point holds no promise. I mean, first of all, who would you be supporting? There's so many different groups on the ground at this point. If you armed the so-called rebels, who are you even arming? It's not clear. I mean, the United States has a very poor relationship with a lot of the rebel groups, the opposition groups at this point. Uh, it's very hard to even have a conversation with these guys. We had a hard enough time getting them to show up in Geneva. Uh, so we need to be pretty clear-eyed about just how little the West can do in this case and how much control we have over the situation. But I think perhaps one could argue in retrospect that there was a window for some sort of military support to the opposition maybe a year and a half ago. It seems like that window has closed. At this point, it's really all we can do is work the political negotiation piece as hard as possible. But as we've seen, it's, it's really deteriorated in, in recent rounds. And at this point, I mean, other than the Russians getting the regime to show up in Geneva, we've had very, very little cooperation from their side. And so th there's, there's not a lot I can say. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a horrible, it haunted me when I was at the White House all the time. I mean, it, it's a, a, a tragedy of just unbelievable scale and scope, um, particularly the refugee crisis, which seems to be growing you know, worse by the week. Uh, and the, I guess the thing that astounds me, I'll say, about Syria is we, we really expected one of the countries, whether it's Jordan or Lebanon or Turkey, to eventually hit a breaking point. And the fact that these countries are still absorbing these huge numbers of refugees is just mind-boggling. But you wonder how much more these countries can sustain, particularly you know, how dire things could get. I mean, we've seen some pretty negative turn of events. I mean, Lebanon's troubling, but so is Jordan. And of course, Iraq closed the border at some point due to violent um, outbreaks and uh, events there and their border. So anyways, I, I, I wish I could stand up here and sketch out um, some magic solution. Um, sadly, there isn't one. And uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's an unbelievable challenge for the transatlantic relationship in the wider region. I just think we're kidding ourselves if we think collectively we won't be asked to do something down the road. Whenever this nightmare ends, I could imagine there being some sort of request for the West to help in one way or another. I don't know if that will be a stabilization force. Maybe not. Maybe that's too ambitious. Maybe it's more in the area of just pure humanitarian assistance. But the last thing I'll say is what's really disheartened me is NATO's inability to even have a conversation about Syria and prohibiting itself from discussing something for fear that it might become a slippery slope. That's a mistake. Because at some point, there could be a knock at NATO's door for any reason. And not allowing the alliance and us as partners to share information about this crisis in that format strikes me as, as as a, just a huge mistake. Um, so I, I've pushed as much as I could to see if we can open that dialogue inside at a minimum at, at the NATO alliance. But I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any magic policy solutions for how to solve the conflict.
All right, so I'm afraid we're running out of time.